I am Y. How's it going? This is a really, really special evening, and I'm honored that you all came out here in the rain. You could have been anywhere in the world. You're here with us, so thank you for that. This is a celebration, and I think it's important to reflect as we come up on the end of the year. 2015 was a big year for the cannabis movement. We had a lot of traction internationally, Uruguay, Canada, Mexico, Chile, all of these countries that are making progress, making us look a little... I'm glad someone in the audience whispered it and I didn't have to. There you go. We had a lot of great progress here in the States. We have the Carers Bill introduced. We saw over 5,000 federal prisoners released. We, we saw some... Thank God. Uh, we saw a lot of states come on board and continue to have success with legal cannabis markets. And, you know, this is, so I think, let, let's just celebrate that for a second. Yeah. Yeah. This is an extra special night for me, uh, so I'm glad I get to share it with all of you because a year ago today, to this day, was the first High and Y event that I organized you know, I don't know, some of you might not, quick show of hands, who's a first timer here tonight? Okay. Welcome! Thank you! So, a year ago today, was the first event under my leadership, and it was an awesome event. We brought in Cy Scott from Leafly, and I just remember the next day, I woke up, and I was just like, holy cow, how am I going to do better than this? We had about 280 members in the community then, and I'm very proud to say that today we're coming up on 1,100. <laughs> We've had a number of really cool, fun events. Some of you have checked us out, and you know. We've done a medical cannabis panel, pot and parenting panel, um, hemp, history, history of prohibition, a lot of wonderful events, and you know none of it would be possible without the support of the community. And I, I have to thank a number of people, some of whom are in the room tonight, some aren't. We got Todd, Socrates, Saf, Josh, Rudy, Claudine, Alex, Arcadia, a lot of folks who have given me a lot of support in, in making this happen. And Without the, this is a community effort, so without the community, we wouldn't be here today. So thank, thank you everyone who's been part of it. And Dana, thank you. I can't believe I forgot you right here. <laughs> Dana. Sorry, he's forgettable. <laughs> Unforgettable. Um, 2015 has been a great year but there's still plenty of work to be done. You don't have to look further than the New York Compassionate Care Act to know that there's still a lot of work to be done. So I'm going to ask all of you to help Hi and Y have another great year, have, help New York have another great year, help the industry have another great year. And one of the things you can do is simply tell your friends about our community. Meetup.com slash Hi and Y. Bring a friend to an event share on social media, have the conversation. If this is important to you, and I'm guessing it is since you came out here tonight, have the conversation, be an activist. Really, we're all here today, not to hear me talk, but because we've got one of the most influential, important, impactful leaders in the cannabis world here with us today, sharing this wonderful celebration evening with us. And I gotta tell you, I'm a little embarrassed to admit this, but a year ago, I didn't know who Steve D'Angelo was. <laughs> Steve, I, I hope you know that. I'm sorry. But, Most of the world doesn't know who Steve D'Angelo is. <laughs> but we're going to change that. Right? Yeah. yeah. I don't know if all of you have had the chance to read the book yet. I think this is required reading for anyone who uses cannabis, anyone who cares about cannabis, 
I wish this came out a year ago because I wouldn't have had to spend a year working my ass off learning all of these things. I could have just read the book and been where I'm at today. Um, so I encourage all of you, first of all, read the book. Arm yourself to have productive, intelligent conversation with people who are less passionate and less familiar about this plant and this culture. You know, where we have a rocket ship lifting off right now, and in 10, 15, 20 years, this industry is gonna, you know, it's gonna be big time, and you won't have the chance, the, the opportunity to make change on the ground floor like we still can do today. So please arm yourself with the knowledge and the facts and, and the wisdom that Steve has put together in this book. And then also, give this book to people in your life who don't know about cannabis or who never received the, an education, who have been subject to the propaganda. I'm gonna give this to my mother tomorrow morning. <laughs> and that's, that's not a joke. Um, and also, uh, but here's a joke. <laughs> this is a sold out event, I'm, I'm like pumped to have that. A gentleman emailed me last night and offered me a quarter of weed to get into the event. I said what I hope any proud high and white and wire would say. I said, do you have lab tests? <laughs> I'll be here all week. All right. <laughs> Enough of that. I'm going to bring up Steve D'Angelo. If you don't know who he is, you're about to find out. He's had a pivotal role in some of the most influential, important institutions in legal cannabis, from Harborside Health Center to the Arcview Group to Steve Hill Lab, and many, many more. And even before that, he was on the ground with guys like Dana, doing lots of work for this industry since before I was even alive. So I am so grateful and honored that Steve took the time to be with us here tonight. And I'm just going to hand it over to Steve, and he's going to read from his wonderful book. Wow, uh, remarkably generous introduction. Thank you so much, Michael. And I'm just so impressed uh, by what I'm seeing here at Impact Hub and High NY. Uh, a lot of creativity and collaboration, um, which is a beautiful thing to witness, especially in the cannabis sector. It's also great to be in New York, one of my very favorite cities in the whole wide world. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, a little bit of the preface which sort of explains why I wrote the book. And one of the things that I don't like about book readings is that I, it's very difficult for me to make eye contact with my audience. So forgive me as I put myself into this book to read it to you. And um, between passages, uh, if uh, there's you know, any questions uh, that come up for you relating to the passage, feel free to shout them out in between passages. And if we have some time at the end, we can take some more general um, questions. I hope we do. <clears throat> it may all have been predestined. My mother somehow had the great foresight and vision to give birth to me at exactly 4.20 p.m. <laughs> June 12, 1958. Decades later, 4.20 became the insider's code word for cannabis. How mom managed that feat is beyond me, but I am eternally grateful. From my first experience with cannabis, I knew it was good, not evil. I also knew it would play a large role in my life. Almost like a deja vu experience, I recognized it the first time I saw it. Some young prodigies sit down at a piano, or build computers, or solve complex <coughs> mathematical equations. I picked up the cannabis plant. My life is unfolded in pace with the trajectory of cannabis from the margins of American society in the 1950s to the counterculture in the 60s and 70s to industrial hemp in the 80s to medical use in the 90s to state regulated distribution in the 2000s. As I learned more about cannabis, my understanding of it evolved. Before encountering the plant, I had viewed cannabis as an intoxicant because that is the only way it had been described to me. My own first consumption revealed a deeper significance. The cannabis could enhance my spiritual awareness and personal introspection. I discovered that cannabis helped me sleep 
and added to my enjoyment of music, food, and sex. Then I found out the plant that some call marijuana is an eco-friendly source of food, fiber, fuel, fabric, paper, and thousands of other products. Later still, I learned about its palliative properties, the power to make ill people feel better. And then I discovered the preventive and curative properties of cannabis, its ability to control seizures, lift depression and anxiety, shrink cancer tumors, and prevent Alzheimer's. I fell in love with the plant. I couldn't stand the idea of its value being overlooked or people being persecuted because they recognize that value. Cannabis isn't a harm that should be prohibited or grudgingly tolerated. It's a benefit that should be promoted. I still feel that way today. That's why I wrote this book. So uh, another reason that I, I wrote this book was that there were a lot of stories that I experienced uh, that I thought illustrated um, larger themes in, in, in this war that we've been uh, suffering under for so long. And, um, and some people, uh, some of whom aren't with us anymore, that I really wanted to memorialize and honor. So I'm going to uh, read you a passage now that tells one of those stories. Black people in the United States consume cannabis at about the same rate as white people. But FBI and state databases show that blacks consistently <laughs> suffer higher rates of arrest for possession of cannabis than do whites in every single one of the 50 states. Nationwide, African Americans suffer a marijuana arrest rate four times higher than whites. In urban areas with large populations of people of color, the statistics verge on the unbelievable. 15 times as many African Americans are arrested for cannabis possession in Chicago as white people, and 40 times as many are convicted. In New York, almost nine out of 10 people arrested for possession were black or Latino, and both the cities arrested more minority youth for cannabis than for any other criminal offense. In the nation's capital, the sacred symbols of our democracy preside over a city where 91% of the people arrested for cannabis are black at a time when the African American population of the city is shrinking. Most white people I share these statistics with have a hard time accepting them, but African Americans know exactly what I'm talking about. Racial disparity has always been a part of cannabis enforcement. The consequences of my youthful cannabis use paled in comparison to those of my African American friends like Eddie Weems. Eddie and I started smoking together when we were students at Tacoma Park Junior High School. His mom was a clerk in the same federal office building my father worked in as an executive. We shared our cannabis with each other and the joy and wonder it brought us and the 70s funk music we both loved. Eddie lived in the almost entirely black projects on the other side of town from my almost completely white neighborhood. Like me, Eddie often smoked outside so his mom wouldn't catch him. But the police did. By the time Eddie and I got to Blair High School, he'd been arrested three times and locked up in juvenile hall twice. He got busted again midway through our sophomore year and never made it back to school. The next time I saw Eddie, he was working as a bar back and janitor at Shepherd Park Bar and Grill, our local strip club. It was the only job he could get, given his education and record. Eddie died a year later, running in for the third time to save mostly white bikers from a flaming Shepherd Park. The bar had been torched after a racial altercation. I was protected by white privilege as a teenager, so my early scrapes with the law left me relatively unscathed. For me, it was possible to go on to college and build a career, but most low-income minority youth arrested for cannabis are locked out of education and employment and the programs designed to assist them. Left without viable prospects of advancement, some turns to gangs and more serious crimes. Young people who need help the most are denied it. A cycle of crime and desperation continues for another generation, and taxpayer dollars are poured down yet another drain. Brilliant. Yeah, I was a little bitter when I wrote that one. another personal story. 
person who's no longer with us. Illustrates a larger theme, a theme particularly relevant in New York uh, because the law will not protect this category of patients. At first, my stepmother Ginny just misplaced things and nobody put it together for a while. Then it became difficult for her to answer simple questions and dad took her to the doctor. I'd never imagined my hard, charging, tough father as a caregiver, but as Ginny lost her memory, dad picked up the slack. By the end, he was tenderly feeding her by hand, transferring her from bed to wheelchair to toilet and brushing her hair every morning. He would sit holding Ginny's hand for hours, listening to her rattling off increasingly inane stories, desperate to see some small spark of recognition in her eyes. Next to cancer, Alzheimer's may be the most feared disease in the developed world. The plaques and tangles it deposits in the brain disrupt the singles between neurons, and the perception of time and recollection of basic knowledge become difficult or impossible. Memories eventually disappear entirely. Patients become unable to recognize loved ones, and sometimes they turn angry and violent. Most patients die from infections as they forget, to, as they forget how to urinate, defecate, swallow, and chew, sometimes lying in their own waste. The disease is growing to epidemic proportions. At least 44 million people worldwide have been di diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And that number is expected to double by 2030. It will double again by 2050 if nothing is done to stop it. Alzheimer's is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States, and regular cannabis use may be the best way to prevent the disease. Researchers at the world-renowned Scripps Research Institute announced this important medical breakthrough in 2006, reporting that THC possesses, quote, remarkable inhibitory qualities for the plaques common to Alzheimer's, and its effects are obtained via a previously unrecognized molecular mechanism. They're talking about the endocannabinoid system. Subsequent studies supported the Scripps research and found that the mechanism works by providing neural protection and reducing inflammation. In another wonderful example of the elegance of cannabis biochemistry, the British Journal of Pharmacology reported that cannabinoids simultaneously support the brain's intrinsic repair mechanism and the growth of new brain cells. I wish we'd known all that in time to save my stepmother. Okay, so I'm going to move away from the heavy stories for a little bit. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think this is a crowd that's fairly familiar with, with prohibition and the ills of prohibition. Um, um, so I'm not going to spend a lot more time there. I'm going to move on to uh, thinking about and talking about how we ourselves look at cannabis, how we relate to it, uh, what kind of relationship we have to it. Um, because as you'll tell from this, this passage, which is a little bit lengthy, um, I think that, that a lot of us uh, are still carrying around some um, outdated and inaccurate concepts about our own cannabis use. <clears throat> this one starts with a kind of fun story. Bill O'Reilly eyed my brother and me like a hungry lion looking over a couple of lambs. <laughs> He twisted his face into the trademark O'Reilly sneer and scolded us with a tone of triumph. Come on, you know what the ruse is. You know what the scam is. I'd known the comment was coming. It's standard procedure for hostile journalists. They all think medical cannabis is a fraud. My own cannabis recommendation is technically for chronic pain, but I used it for many other purposes. Some were unquestionably therapeutic, like helping me sleep. Others, like shaking off nervousness or sadness, seemed borderline. But there were some that just didn't fit my definition of medical use, like enhancing the enjoyment of a meal or a piece of music. Like most people, I used to be locked into an outdated illness concept of human health that views us as either sick or healthy. If we're sick, 
we go to the doctor who writes a prescription or recommends a procedure, after which we're supposed to recover and go back to being healthy, if we're lucky. But over the last few decades, it's become evident that human health actually operates on a spectrum of wellness. That spectrum occupies the space between perfect health and acute sickness, and it's where most humans spend the majority of their lives. The best ways to preserve and enhance wellness are safe and non-invasive. We've learned that diet, exercise, acupuncture, chiropractic, meditation, and other holistic healing techniques are effective alternatives to pills and operations. That's why so many gyms and yoga studios have opened in the United States, why most grocery stores have an organic section, why insurance policies often cover chiropractic acupuncture and nutritional counseling, and why integrative treatment centers for cancer have experienced explosive growth. California law, which allows doctors to recommend cannabis for any purpose for which it is effective, had already forced me to consider O'Reilly's comment. Over the years, many patients confided in me that they appreciated the protection of the law, but didn't really consider themselves sick or injured. Non-patients also frequently approached me with comments like, you know, Steve, I totally support everything you're doing to help patients. I believe in medical cannabis, and I smoke weed myself. But I'm not sick. I just like to get high. So uh, <laughs> I would respond by asking for details. When and why do you use cannabis? What specific benefits does it provide? How has cannabis made your life different? And a composite of the answers I received would run something like this. Without cannabis, I'd get home feeling irritated from a long day at work, a hassle with a boss or a coworker, a hot rush hour commute, whatever. My back might be aching, and I wouldn't feel like playing with my kids or talking to my wife. I'd often have a sour stomach and not much appetite. Dinner wasn't terribly appealing, sometimes gave me heartburn or indigestion. <coughs> After dozing off in front of the TV, I'd wake up and sometimes not be able to go back to sleep. In the morning, I could be tired and not feel like going to work or doing much of anything. With cannabis, everything's different. I'm happy to see my family and have as much fun playing with my kids as they do. I forget about my aching back, and reuniting with my wife is a pleasure, not a chore. Dinner smells and tastes great, and I never have a problem with indigestion. After dinner, the wife and I put the kids to bed, and then we have some extra special intimate time together. I curl up next to her, sleep soundly till morning, and wake up refreshed and ready for the new day. Cannabis makes my life a lot better, but I'm not sick, and I wouldn't die or end up in the hospital without it. I'm not a patient. I just like cannabis. So over time, you know, I realized that the same description of symptoms presented to the average MD would probably result in a diagnosis of anxiety, insomnia, depression, arthritis, low libido, erectile dysfunction, and acid reflux. <laughs> every night, every night, a parade of ads promoting a variety of pharmaceuticals <laughs> for exactly these conditions marches out of our TV sets, and most of them have a list of side effects like something out of a Stephen King novel. Oh my God. <laughs> For most people, a cannabis is a better alternative. Its power to preserve and restore homeostasis throughout the brain and body makes cannabis effective for almost every condition advertised on TV, and its side effects are mild and transitory. It also has a wide range of more unique benefits that are frequently overlooked or mistakenly characterized as getting high. These include its ability to extend patience and promote self-examination, to awaken a sense of wonder and playfulness and openness to spiritual experience, to enhance the flavor of a meal, the sound of music, or the sensitivity of a lover's touch, to open the mind and inspire creativity, to bring poetry to language and spontaneity to a performer, to catalyze laughter, facilitate friendship, and bridge human differences. When I first shared this interpretation with my father, he gave me his don't bullshit me look. 
<laughs> Dad was already using cannabis for pain and insomnia, so he, he didn't outright challenge me. <laughs> but I could tell I too strayed too far into New Age woo-woo territory for his comfort. So on our next visit, I was pleasantly surprised to hear that my father had noticed an increased desire to write his memoirs, to do something creative, after his evening dose of THC-rich tincture. <coughs> and after his grief, my father had lost his wife. After his grief had subsided enough to date again, Dad very discreetly let me know that he'd also discovered its ability to enhance sensuality and intimacy. These are not the attributes of an intoxicant, which is defined by Merriam-Webster as a substance that can, quote, excite or stupefy to the point where physical and mental control is markedly diminished, unquote. These are the attributes of a wellness product that enhances and facilitates some of the most meaningful parts of the human experience. I actually think that's the most original idea that's in the book. Uh, that's why the subtitle uh, related back uh, to that topic. Um, it's, it's really been interesting for me as I've gone around the country uh, and talked to people about their reactions uh, to these thoughts. Uh, some really things that I, I wasn't expecting happened. They're, they've all been quite beautiful. I've had um, a young people coming up to me uh, and saying, you know, I read this and I started thinking about my own cannabis use and you know I started not being entirely comfortable with some of the ways I was using cannabis and I started thinking about it and I'm using with a lot more intention and consciousness now I'm not using as much as I used to but I'm getting a lot more out of it now I did not write this book to encourage people to moderate their cannabis use <laughs> <laughs> happened right uh, and then the other comments that I've gotten uh, that have really been wonderful are uh, people uh, saying um, that they've finally been cured of their lingering stoner shame. That's great. So uh, I'm going to tell you the story of how we came to the word marijuana and how the War against medical can war against cannabis uh, began in the United States. Grown in almost any environment, useful for fiber, food, fuel, and medicine, cannabis has been a friend to the poor and dispossessed in a wide range of societies and cultures. Poets, novelists, musicians, and artists through the ages have prized it for its ability to catalyze the creative process. Free thinkers, religious mystics and seekers of all persuasions have used it to open the doors of perception since the dawn of human civilization. And those with few resources have turned to it to clothe and heal their bodies and ease the hardships of their lives. Medica <clears throat> Modern science has conclusively demonstrated the safety and medical efficacy of cannabis, but its close association with marginalized social classes earned it the suspicion of religious and political elites in widely divergent times and places, as it still does to this day. One of those places was Spain in 1492. Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand had just expelled the Moors from the southern part of the Iberian Peninsula. Though ruled by Muslims, Moorish society welcomed all faiths, valued intellectual and artistic expression, and saw tolerance as a social virtue. Cannabis was legal, and its use was normal and commonplace. It was considered a safe alternative to alcohol, which was banned under Islam, but still widely consumed and tolerated by Moorish rulers. Is that After defeating the Moors, Isabella and Ferdinand set about restoring their dark version of the Catholic faith. Centers of learning that had flourished for centuries were closed. Books were burned in public spectacles. Jews, gypsies, and others who refused to convert to Catholicism were expelled from the country. Heretics, quote unquote, were tortured to death, and cannabis consumption was prohibited, along with anything else that smelled vaguely Islamic. The Spanish Inquisition had begun with the ugliness characteristic of all intolerance. Not coincidentally, for the purposes of our tale, 1492 is also the year Christopher Columbus claimed America as the newest possession of Isabella and Ferdinand. 
It didn't take long for both cannabis and the campaign against it to take root in the New World. Cannabis was brought to the New World by Columbus, and the plant was first cultivated here by Spanish conquistadors, not long after their victory over the Aztec Empire. The intended purpose was to grow hemp for the ropes and sails of the Spanish fleet, not for human consumption. Colonial records show that conquistadors' attempts to grow hemp in the tropics of the New World largely failed, and they probably weren't even aware of the other uses of cannabis. But Mexico's expert doctors, or curanderos, didn't have a problem making the leap. Plants were their main source of medicine, so the curanderos quite naturally investigated cannabis upon encountering it. When they found it efficacious for a wide range of ailments, the indigenous healers incorporated it into their practice and began to sell it openly in marketplaces. They called it, and I love this name, it's one of my very favorite names for cannabis. They called it Pipil Zincintlis, or the most noble princes. The Coranderos believe that each medicinal plant is associated with a unique divine spirit a belief that put them on a collision course with the Spanish church well before their adoption of cannabis. In the view of priests determined to convert the Indios, the Coranderos preserved the memory of the old gods and slowed the spread of Catholicism. It wasn't until the 1770s that native use of Pipils and Zintlis caught the attention of the Spanish. Almost immediately, rumors were spread that it facilitated visions, madness, and communion with the devil. Colonial authorities responded with prohibitionist edicts, and pipils and zintlis disappeared from the public marketplace. Hemp cultivation was successful farther north in what would later become the United States. Like the conquistadors, English sailors and settlers carried hemp seed with them to the New World. Hemp was a strategic raw material of critical importance because it produced the ropes and sails that powered the ships that held together all the maritime empires. This led British colonial authorities to pass the first cannabis laws in North America more than 100 years before the revolution. Settlers were required to plant hemp seed and allowed to pay their taxes with the harvest. George Washington and the founding fathers all grew cannabis. The Declaration of Independence was drafted on hemp paper, and it's been widely reported that Betsy Ross's first American flag was woven from hemp fiber. So were the covers of the Conestoga wagons, wagons that covered settler. <clears throat> so were the covers of the Conestoga wagons that carried settlers west, and the homespun, homespun spot textiles they wore on their backs. Did you all get that? If I had known how hard that sentence was going to be to read, I would have written it differently. <laughs> After its medical applications became more widely known in the 1800s, cannabis was officially listed in the United States Pharmacopeia and prescribed by numerous American doctors. Most people thought of cannabis as a medicine or a raw material if they thought about it at all. It wasn't until they heard about marijuana that they got alarmed. Nobody really knows for sure where the word came from. It came into use in Mexico after the Spanish priest banned the sale of Pipils and Zintlis, and probably served as a code name for those in the know. Historians' best guess, guess is that it was the result of an effort to rebrand the plant in a more Catholic-friendly format. Indigenous cannabis consumers combined the name Maria, the mother of Jesus, <laughs> with Juana, the common Spanish word for property or stuff, marijuana. Much safer word. By 1846, the practice of smoking Mary's stuff was heavily reported in Mexican newspapers. Hundreds of lurid tales were published about marijuana causing insanity and criminality among soldiers, prisoners, Indians, and other denizens of the lower classes. And here's one typical example from uh, the Voz, La Voz de Mexico, describing a man who, quote, turned himself into a beast, launched himself at the passerby, attempting to dismember them then turned on himself, and with bites, he tore apart his own arms until a straight jacket could be put on him. Huh. <clears throat> El Pais told the story of a prisoner who, quote, smoked some marijuana and criminally deprived of the faculties which God gave man, turned into a madman and attacked two of his fellow prisoners, burying a knife into them and causing their deaths. So what happened is that in 1898, the AP opens a bureau in Mexico City and they start 
reprinting these lurid articles that are being in the Mexican press uh, about cannabis starting around 1898. And <coughs> of course, when the you know, huge amount of even more racism then than there is now, when these uh, small town American papers got a hold of these stories, they would do their own jobs on them. So just a few choice quotes here. Um, the uh, Spirit Lake, Iowa Beacon. Uh, under, its under its influence, the sedate Mexican becomes noisy as a cowboy and has to be lassoed and put into the calaboose. Uh, Marysville, Ohio Tribune got its hands on the story next. And they said, uh, mixed with tobacco, the Mexicans revel in it. Saturated with this drug, they forget all of the ills and cares of life, are reckless and pugnacious, and will fight on the smallest provocation or no provocation at all. All sorts of, of, of wild uh, descriptions there. So it was really the, uh, what happened is uh, over the course of the next 12, 14 years, uh, a series of these articles were published all across the country. And in 1910, we started seeing large numbers of Mexican refugees uh, fleeing the violence and the chaos of the revolution coming across the border into places like California and Arizona. Uh, and that is when we saw the first, the very first cannabis laws passed in the United States. And they were formed, uh, they were passed, uh, as you can tell by the quotes uh, from the legislators in the newspapers. There's other quotes from legislators that are even worse. Um, they were passed as a, message, as a method of racial control. And so, you know, the lesson there is that uh, racial disparity, which is now fortunately widely recognized, New York Times had a you know, large article about it. Um, what's not so widely recognized is that racial disparity is not some unintended consequence of cannabis laws that just happened, right? It was the prime motivating purpose from the beginning. Pretty disgusting, huh? So I'm going to close <coughs> with a call to arms. This is from the end of the book. No matter the country or its laws, religions, or current understanding about cannabis, access to the cannabis plant is a human right, like access to all healing botanicals. We are all born into the same web of life. We are all the children of Mother Nature, and cannabis is one of the most precious gifts she's given us. When handled with care and respect, the plant can safely provide us with food, fuel, fiber, medicine, spiritual connection, and wellness. Cannabis is a birthright of all human beings, and nobody has ever been justified in trying to take it away from us. Let it rip. The tipping point for cannabis has arrived and there's no question about where we're headed. Full legalization will come to the whole world sooner or later. Hundreds of millions of people have directly experienced the benefits of the plant and many of us have been inspired to dedicate our lives to changing the laws. Our memories are not short, our energy is not low, and our minds are not dimmed by ignorance or superstition. We will not rest, and we will not stop until the last cannabis prisoner is set free. Before I do audience questions, I actually have a question for you. Sure. Um, in thinking about the future, you know, I'm excited for California next year. You mentioned it a little earlier to me. Um, I'm wondering if you could just give us a sense of what's going on over there, because the latest I heard was, you know, we have Sean Parker, you know, the tech millionaire, Facebook investor, Napster guy, and uh, he's not not exactly doing doing uh, great things for us. So I'd be curious to hear from you what, what the scene is like over there. <clears throat> well, the scene is in flux uh, over there right now. Uh, there was a long collaborative process between most of the major stakeholders uh, in California uh, that was well underway. Uh, we were working towards a unity draft that everybody could get behind. Um, the, uh, the 
plan had been that a number of donors, including Mr. Parker, would fund that campaign. Uh, at the rather late in the game, um, word came from the Parker camp that they were not going to be working within that process, that they were going to be putting together their own draft and hiring their own campaign consultants. Um, since that uh, announcement, um, activists in California have been in either engaging with or <laughs> fighting with and denouncing uh, the, the Parker camp, um, trying to um, hopefully you know, bring us to a place where we have something that we can all support. Now, frankly, uh, I think that there's way more heat around this uh, than there should be. Uh, in California, uh, we are a very large and a very diverse state. There are a lot of interests, even within the cannabis community, uh, and, and, and those interests aren't always in alignment with each other. So it's, it's never easy for us to achieve unity in, in California. That's why we lost in 2010. Um, I've read and been intimately involved in the drafting process of, of the two leading uh, initiatives, that Reform CA and the Parker Initiative. You know, at the end of the day, I would vote for either one of them. <laughs> I would vote for either one of them, and I'd be damn happy that they passed. You know? uh, there is a, a, a cannabis initiative is going to have to be really, really, really bad for me not want to vote for it. Like Ohio? Like Ohio. Okay. <laughs> I wouldn't have voted for Ohio. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the Parker draft certainly could be improved. This Reform CA draft certainly can be improved. There's a guy named George Mull who wrote a draft that I think is amazing. But what I've learned is no piece of legislation is perfect. And uh, we all have to be willing to accept that uh, it's going to have something in it that really, really bothers us. And we all have to accept that there's probably also not going to be something in it that we really, really want. And then we just have to get over it and pass it anyhow. Question in the back from Lex. Uh, thanks. Uh, how have you seen activism change since your good old Jack Hare days till now? Well, uh, that's a great question. When I was a young activist, uh, if I wanted to catch the government in a lie, I would have to go out to the University of Maryland. I was living in D.C. then. Uh, I'd have to thumb through these things we had called card catalogs. Okay? <laughs> Uh, and I have to find uh, the, the right periodical, the right date, and then I go up to the stacks. And this was like literally miles and miles and miles of bookshelves. And then I have to trudge these miles of bookshelves. It would take like two or three days to disprove a government lie. If I could find the information to do that. And then we printed them up on mimeograph machines. <laughs> And we put them in envelopes and we put stamps on them and we mailed them, okay? Now, you pull out your phone or your pad, you catch the government in a lie in three minutes, you inform your 10,000 comrades around the world, you form a committee, you do a petition, you take action, and change happens, right? So, uh, that's how it's changed. And, uh, you know, I, I am just so thrilled uh, to see the, the, the juncture between what I call the smartest generation, the generation of Americans who have grown up with computers in their hands, who have an unparalleled ability to synthesize, to collect new information and then act on it. The juncture of that generation with cannabis has already rapidly accelerated the movement and, and it's going to carry us into the future. It's really exciting. You know, it's kind of like obscenity. <laughs> you know, I, you know it when you see it, um, but it's difficult to define. Um, it has to be pretty bad. And you know, in the case of Ohio, the reason that that, that I would not uh, vote for it in Ohio uh, is that you know I think that that was a law that was more at home in Vladimir Putin's Russia than in the United States of America. I think we can do a hell of a lot better than that in this country, and, and I think the people of Ohio eventually are going to do it. Um, but any time that you uh, oppose, uh, uh, and I oppose, 
a cannabis initiative. Really, the only time I've ever opposed a cannabis initiative was Ohio. Uh, so it's, 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 it's going to have to be pretty extreme for me not to vote for it. Um, I've learned that change is an incremental process. And uh, you don't, don't, don't sacrifice a good change uh, in the quest for a perfect change, because that perfect change is never coming. Yeah. It will never get here. Bob? Do you think that eventually uh, places in Asia, like uh, Japan or South Korea, for instance, would follow on whatever happens here in the States as far as legalization? Because right now, obviously, they're really cracking down on that and have been for a long time, but that wasn't really part of their whole history. So I'm just curious what your thoughts on that are. Your cannabis has a rich uh, culture in both Korea and in Japan. Um, and, uh, you know, cannabis plays a, a, a very important role in Shinto uh, uh, religion. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'll tell you a little story, this cute story um, uh, about this. And I think the basic answer is yes, they will. And I think that that's true of the rest of the world, that they will follow the lead of the United States. So I happened to view uh, a Japanese talk show about cannabis. It was this wild show because in Japan they have these comedy talk shows. And they'll have a bunch of different characters on the talk show, but they'll be talking about something serious, but they'll all kind of go off on it a little bit. And they had this one American guy who was like the token American guy, and you know, they had like a very you know, straight Japanese guy, and then they had this Korean guy. Um, and, and, the, and they're talking, and the Korean guy goes, these Americans, they just can't make up their mind. You know, in the 1960s and the 1950s, all of our own grandfathers, the old farmers, you know, the old men when they couldn't work anymore, they would smoke cannabis and it made them feel better and then they were easier to deal with. They weren't so cranky and everybody was happy. <laughs> and then the Americans came along and they said, no, no, this is awful, it's bad, it's a drug, it's terrible. And they made us get rid of it, you know? And now they're coming back and they're saying, no, no, it's actually a medicine, it's good, we're gonna bring it back again, you know? Can't they just make up their minds? So, um, on a serious note, the, uh, the roots um, of modern prohibition uh, around the world were laid by Harry Anslinger, who after he had a multi-decade career torturing us here in the United States, was appointed uh, as the uh, US Drug Commissioner to the United Nations, where he used the clout of the United States, especially I think 1962, uh, to force countries all around the world to make cannabis illegal. And, uh, and so we did it, we can undo it. Hey yo, positive in your brains and carries like a train. Take away your pain like killers. Some fill the liver with liquor, other pop their lungs full of skunk. And they compensate for misplaced functions lost at the junction. Now I say life is more visible through a lit up eye. Sockets plugged into light receptors. We're not fueled by darkness, check the tanks empty. We need the sun to synthesize and grow to reach plenty.